Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. My name is Mike Brown, and I am here in the Dark Poutine studio in Langley, British Columbia, and Matthew is back home in Vancouver. Hello, Matthew Stockton. How are you today? <laughs> he asked uh, sort of with trepidation because I know you're cranky. Before we're recording, Mike and I are talking, it's one of those days where every, sing every single thing that could have went wrong went wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, probably not unlike this uh, episode and what happened. Yeah. A series of, of events. Uh, but that was my day. But I'm here, tits and teeth, happy to be yep. doing the show instead of like working. So let's get at it. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime in the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. On October 21st, 2021, a tragic accident occurred on the set of the low-budget Old West movie, Rust, filmed on a New Mexico ranch. Wife, mother, and cinematographer Helena Hutchins, 42, was fatally shot, and writer-director Joel Souza, 48, was injured. It was the lead actor and producer on the film, Alec Baldwin, who was holding the prop gun that killed Helena Hutchins and wounded Joel Souza. Somehow, it contained a live round. Investigations also revealed other live rounds on set, which is never supposed to happen. Baldwin and the film's inexperienced armorer, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, 24, were charged with involuntary manslaughter. Dave Hall, 63, serving as the first assistant director on the film, entered a no-contest plea in accordance with a deal made with prosecutors, accepting responsibility for the misdemeanor offense of negligent use of a deadly weapon linked to the death of Helena Hutchins. Numerous civil suits have also been filed, with accusations of negligence being leveled against several parties, including the production company itself, Hannah Gutierrez, and actor Alec Baldwin. In this, the first of two parts, you will learn about the tragic trail of events leading up to the shooting. This is Dark Poutine Episode 310, Away Game, Reckless Rust, The Death of Helena Hutchins. I've worked on over 30 film and television projects in various roles in several on-set departments. I've worked on several sets with armorers, those responsible for firearms on set, and done day calls in the props department. So this one hits home for me. Especially after my time in the AD assistant directing department, safety on set is something that I take very seriously. The first assistant director, first AD, 
a position I've performed just once on the set of a short film called Pappy and Speedster, is central to maintaining safety on a film set. The first AD seamlessly bridges the gap between the director's creative ambitions and the practicalities of production. Their role encompasses a broad range of responsibilities to ensure the well-being of the cast and crew. From the pre-production phase, the first AD is actively involved in assessing potential risks, participating in meetings to discuss safety measures, and strategizing on how to execute stunts and special effects safely. They are also responsible for organizing safety meetings to ensure everyone on set knows the procedures and precautions for the day's shoot. As the main conduit for communication on set, the first AD ensures clear and continuous dialogue about safety protocols among all parties. They coordinate closely with departments such as stunts and special effects to integrate safety recommendations into the production plan. A good first AD is vigilant in enforcing safety standards, monitoring the set for hazards, and ensuring compliance with safety regulations, including using appropriate protective gear. In times of crisis, the first AD manages emergency responses, securing the set and assisting in evacuation procedures if necessary. Their role extends beyond the immediate needs of the set, participating in post-production debriefs to evaluate safety practices and contribute to a culture of continuous improvement in safety standards. Overall, the First AD's comprehensive approach to safety is pivotal in facilitating a secure environment that supports the creative process while protecting the film's most valuable asset, its people. Yeah, you know, Mike, you you worked in film. I've Mm -hmm. done probably hundreds of television commercials in my life still shoots and television commercials right sure you know things from like i've hoisted a woman 60 feet into the air wearing an angel thing for 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 uh what was that what's that horrible white powder you put into your like horrible instant coffee coffee mate coffee mate i did a coffee kick mate commercial for like literally hoisting a woman like all kinds of crazy stuff i've like a 747 being pulled down a runway and yeah, there's, uh, I've never had, never had a bad accident or, mm. or anyone actually even get hurt on set before. Um, but yeah, I mean, your experience, you understand it and me less so, right? Less so, but, right. uh, you know, involved in productions and, um, it's, uh, you know, if, if the people are getting hurt and killed, yeah, the, the show does not go on. No. Overall, ADs treat safety and accidents on set with the utmost seriousness. Although rare, fatalities on film sets have occurred over the years. According to a review of U.S. government data and published reports by the Los Angeles Times, at least 19 fatal injuries took place on film sets nationwide from 2010 to 2019. Overall, at least 47 fatalities have occurred among 250 film production accidents since 1990. Furthermore, the Associated Press, AP, estimates that there have been 43 fatalities on American film sets since 1990, along with another 150 actors or crew members left with life-altering injuries. Some of these have led to civil suits, industry-wide safety inquiries, regulatory changes, and in rare cases, criminal charges. One notable tragedy occurred in 1982 on the set of Twilight Zone, the movie. Actor Vic Morrow and two child actors, Micah Din Lee and Renee Shinyi Chen, died during a stunt involving a helicopter. The helicopter crashed on them during a scene involving explosions, leading to Morrow and one of the children being decapitated and the other child crushed. The film's director, John Landis, and four other crew members were charged with involuntary manslaughter. The case went to trial, marking a rare instance where filmmakers were held criminally responsible for their actions taken during production. After a lengthy trial, all defendants were acquitted in 1987. The families of the deceased filed lawsuits against Warner Brothers, John Landis, and other production entities involved. The cases were settled out of court for undisclosed amounts, though it was widely reported that the settlements were substantial. 
The incident brought to light violations of California's child labor laws, including hiring children for hazardous work at night and without proper permits. This led to stricter enforcement of existing laws and heightened awareness of child actors' safety and labor conditions. The fatalities prompted the film industry to adopt more rigorous safety standards and protocols. The Directors Guild of America and other industry bodies emphasized the importance of safety on set, leading to the development of more comprehensive guidelines for stunt work and the use of special effects. The tragedy led to increased scrutiny of film sets by regulatory bodies and advocacy groups. The tragedy led to increased scrutiny of film sets by regulatory bodies and advocacy groups. There was a push for transparency in how scenes involving stunts and potential hazards were planned and executed. The incident underscored the need for dedicated safety professionals on film sets, leading to a rise in the hiring of safety coordinators and consultants who specialize in complex sequences like stunts and special effects. Yeah, I thought there would be um, stricter child labor laws earlier than that. I can remember early 90s Moscow, right? Mm -hmm. We actually used for Nesquik, you know, it used to be called Quick, right? Nesquik. Yep. Um, we used to use a woman who could do a child's voice as voiceover sure. because of the child labor laws at the time. So we just used an adult to fake it, right? Because mm -hmm. it was so limited. And just thinking back that if Russia had uh, the child labor laws that strict back then, you think America would as well. Well, I, I, I think it also mentions in the text that I read that there were not proper permits Mm. There was a lot around that particular event, the Twilight Zone movie, that was uh, a little, as we see over and over again, when people are pushed to, you know, hurry, 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 this is what happens. This kind of stuff happens. And if corners are cut to save money, mm. sometimes people die. The deaths of Morrow and the two children left a lasting mark on Hollywood, serving as a somber reminder of the potential costs of negligence and the importance of prioritizing safety over artistic ambition or budget constraints. More recently, in a tragic event that shook the film industry and highlighted the importance of safety protocols on set, camera assistant Sarah Jones was killed during the filming of Midnight Rider, a biographical film about musician Greg Allman. On February 10, 2014, the film crew was setting up a shot on a railroad trestle in Wayne County, Georgia, when a train unexpectedly approached. Despite the crew's attempts to clear the tracks, Sarah Jones was struck and killed by the train. The incident also injured several other crew members. The aftermath of Sarah Jones' death led to significant legal and industry-wide consequences, again. The incident highlighted that the film's producers did not have permission from the railroad company to film on the tracks. This revelation led to criminal charges and civil lawsuits. Significant legal repercussions and a profound industry-wide impact ensued. Regarding legal consequences, Randall Miller, the film's director, entered a guilty plea to charges of involuntary manslaughter and criminal trespassing as part of a plea agreement. He received a two-year jail sentence was placed on probation thereafter, and was barred from directing or assisting in the direction of any film during his probation period. Additionally, the Jones family pursued wrongful death lawsuits against multiple involved parties, including Miller, various producers, and the railroad company. These suits were resolved outside of court, though, again, the specific terms of the settlements were not disclosed. I have to admit that... Uh... On September the 12th, mm -hmm. after the September 11th, 2001, I got a phone call from the director. I was not at the shoot in another country in Europe uh, that are licensed to helicopter around a um, lighthouse was revoked because September 11th just happened. Yeah. But I demanded that he just quickly fly the helicopter closely, get one shot, and then get out of there. And we did. And... We got the shot. <laughs> so, yeah. So here's the thing. Like, the, I'm glad nothing happened. I mean, that that was, things were grounded at that time because people were nervous. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. It wasn't a safety thing. It was, uh, 
let's not freak people out thing, but we just quickly got the shot. I'm glad nothing happened. The industry felt a profound impact from Jones's untimely death, leading to a heightened awareness of safety on film sets. The incident ignited industry-wide discussions about the necessity for stricter safety protocols and enforcing existing regulations. It really, you know, I'm just going to comment here, it really sucks that deaths have to happen or deaths happen before change is made. The hashtag Safety for Sarah campaign emerged in response to the tragedy, with the film community uniting to enhance safety awareness and honor Jones's memory, resulting in widespread tributes and initiatives aimed at bolstering set safety. Slates for Sarah became a poignant tribute within the industry, with film crews worldwide inscribing messages on their camera slates to emphasize the critical importance of safety in filmmaking. Furthermore, the tragedy prompted unions, production companies, and safety organizations to reassess and strengthen their safety guidelines, underscoring the importance of securing proper permits, ensuring clear communication, and adhering strictly to safety protocols. It's, I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over <laughs> and over again, after each of these tragedies. It's interesting, right? Because, you know, work person's safety, like mm -hmm. on, on a construction site. So, you know, my brother works for the town of Strathroy, right? Yep. And yep. he's crawling, th crawling through sewer systems and stuff like that. You kind of, you think, yeah, union. You think, yeah, safety. But because of the magic of movies, mm -hmm. people don't think of that. But the truth is, yeah, they're making something magical, yeah. right? If it's a good film, <laughs> could be crap, but <laughs> it's a job. It's, mm -hmm. it's work and, yep. and people need to be kept safe. There are so many ways to get hurt on a movie set. There are so many ways. Th that's the thing about all of this is nobody, nobody wants anyone to get hurt. And we've all been in situations with work one way or the other, where it's like, let's just get it done under pressure. Yeah. Right. Yeah where you cut corners where maybe safety is not involved, but like sometimes where I've cut corners, it comes back and bites me because like something was misspelled or, you know what I mean? Sure. But yeah. And, and creating that. And when you're on a budget as well, like I've been on, on tight budgets, tight schedules, trying to get stuff done. And, you know, I feel for everyone involved in this case, um, because for sure, nobody wanted this to happen. Right. And yeah, stupid stupid decisions were made, but, you know, I still feel for everyone. I personally witnessed the aftermath of an onset fatality that took place in Vancouver in the summer of 2017. It was a day off for me at the Vancouver downtown office tower where I worked when stuntwoman Joy Harris died during a motorcycle stunt that went wrong. The incident occurred on August 14th. Harris was performing her first film stunt as the character Domino, a role primarily portrayed by actress Zazie Beetz. The stunt involved Harris riding a motorcycle at a relatively low speed through the doors of a building, the Vancouver Convention Center, across the set, and then down a ramp constructed over a few steps. Unfortunately, during the execution of the stunt, Harris lost control of the motorcycle. After the bike jumped a curb on the opposite side of the street, Harris was thrown through a plate glass window of a nearby building, the one in which I worked. Tragically, she was not wearing a helmet at the time of the accident because the character she was doubling for did not wear one in the scene. This was supposed to be a relatively straightforward and low-risk maneuver, yet it resulted in fatal consequences. Several of my co-workers and friends at the office tower were on scene as the incident occurred, and witnessed the traumatic event and its aftermath. On my return to work the next day, I saw the plywood placed over the window after the accident. There was still other evidence of the accident, blood, that was cleaned up later that morning. Joy Harris was an accomplished racer known for breaking barriers as the first African-American woman to compete in American Motorcyclist Association events. Despite her motorcycle experience, she had yet to complete extensive stunt training, which later raised concerns about safety protocols and training standards on film sets. The accident's aftermath led to investigations by regulatory bodies, including WorkSafe BC, the Workers' Compensation Board of British Columbia. 
Their report highlighted concerns regarding the film's planning and execution of the stunt, including the decision to proceed without Harris wearing a helmet and questions about whether the production had adequately assessed the risks involved. There are many ways to be injured on set, and firearms, although much more rare, are sometimes involved. On October 12, 1984, while on the set of a CBS television series, Cover Up, actor John Eric Hexham was involved in a fatal accident that led to his death. During a delay in filming, Hexham, reportedly bored and playing around, took a 44 Magnum prop gun loaded with blanks and jokingly placed it to his temple. He then pulled the trigger. Although the gun was loaded with blanks, the discharge of the blank cartridge produced a force sufficient to drive a piece of skull into his brain, causing severe hemorrhaging. Hexham was rushed to the hospital, where he underwent five hours of surgery to remove bone fragments from his brain. However, the damage was too severe, and Hexham was pronounced dead six days later, on October 18, 1984, at the age of 26. His death was ruled accidental. This tragic incident served as a stark reminder of the potential dangers of mishandling prop firearms on set, even when they are only loaded with blanks. Blanks can still produce a powerful enough force to cause injury or death if fired at close range. As a result of Hexham's death, there were calls within the industry for stricter safety protocols and regulations regarding the use of firearms and blanks on film and television sets to prevent similar accidents in the future. John Eric Hexham's untimely death also led to increased awareness about the need for on-set safety officers and more rigorous training for actors and crew members in the handling of prop weapons. In Wilmington, North Carolina, Brandon Lee's death on March 31, 1993 during the filming of The Crow is one of the most infamous and tragic accidents in film history. Lee, the son of martial arts legend Bruce Lee, was set to follow in his father's footsteps and become a major star with the release of The Crow. The film, directed by Alex Proyas, was a dark, gothic action movie requiring numerous firearm scenes. This film has just been remade and is about to be released and stars Bill Sarsgaard. The Brandon Lee incident occurred during the filming of a scene that required Lee's character to be shot with a 44 Magnum revolver. Unbeknownst to the cast and crew, mishandled prop handling procedures led to a fatal error. During a previous scene that was not filmed, a dummy cartridge, a real bullet without gunpowder, used for close-up shots to make the guns look loaded, was improperly prepared and inserted into the revolver. The primer, which causes the bullet to fire, was not removed from the dummy cartridge. So when it was struck by the firing pin intended to simulate a firing gun without discharging a projectile, the bullet became lodged in the barrel. Later, without checking the gun for barrel obstructions, the crew replaced the dummy cartridge with a blank round for the scene involving Brandon Lee. Blanks contain gunpowder but no bullet and are intended to create a flash and bang without firing a projectile. However, when actor Michael Massey fired the blank round, the gunpowder's force propelled the lodge bullet out of the barrel with nearly the same force as a live round. Brandon Lee was struck in the abdomen by the bullet and fell to the ground. Initially, some on set thought he was acting. However, it soon became clear that he was seriously wounded. Lee was rushed to the hospital, but despite emergency surgery, he died later that day. He was just 28 years old. The investigation that followed Brandon Lee's death led to increased scrutiny of firearm safety protocols on sets. Although no criminal charges were filed, the incident significantly changed how prop guns were handled and regulated in the film industry. New safety standards were implemented, including more rigorous checks of firearms before and during use. The presence of firearms experts on set and clear guidelines for the manufacture and handling of prop ammunition. So... This is how old I am, Mike. I started when we filmed stuff on film. Yep. And if there was a mistake, I can remember once. It's expensive. It's expensive. Yeah. Did you know what the flame was? Where you'd, you'd, it was called the flame. It was like $15,000 a minute. And you'd like retouch frame by frame, right? Yeah. If, if there was an error in it. 
So my question here is like, at this point, can't we just do visual and sound effects at this point for guns? Like why, why even have guns that have the capability of firing for a movie? There are a lot of films that do do that now. Um, the ones that don't spend the money on the effects, it's very obvious, but there are some, they will have prop guns that are not made to fire. They're not actually real guns. And you can't tell the difference with, with the visual yeah. effects. But it's a filmmaking choice. I don't see a problem with having firearms on set as long as people are doing what they need to do to ensure that they're safe. I mean, I've, I've worked with a lot of firearms on set and yeah. there's never been an incident that I was aware of on a film that I was working on. As far as I could tell, the people who were the armorers that I worked with were very serious about their jobs. A lot of them were ex-military or ex-police, and they they were very, very adamant that safety be practiced. Absolutely. And you get real characters when you're... When you're like. I used to have a have a joke that all of my producers are always these, all like the hard notes producers are always like the chain smoking hard woman who just took yeah. no shit from anyone. Okay, we're gonna do this next. And, yeah, exactly like that. And <laughs> yeah. they always those like, and they're always women, right? Like the the best the best producers I've worked with. Oddly, I'm not saying that women are better, but the best ones I ever worked with, mm -hmm. like running the production of a commercial, mm. has been like a 50 to 60 year old something <laughs> hard nosed chain smoking woman who gets shit done. <laughs> yeah. Brandon Lee's death, much like his father's almost 20 years prior, left the public and his fans in shock, adding to the mystique surrounding the Lee family. The Crow was completed using digital effects and stunt doubles, and it became a cult classic, partly due to the tragic circumstances of its production. Lee's performance and the film's stylistic visuals are a haunting reminder of what could have been a bright future for the young actor. Despite these incidents, the scrutiny that followed each of them, and the changes made to ensure more safety on film sets, somehow, live rounds found their way onto the New Mexico set of the Western Rust, ultimately killing cinematographer Helena Hutchins. After the break, we'll learn more about Helena and her involvement in the film. And we are back, Matthew. Thoughts? You know, I've, I've done so many shoots in my life and had no, no real issues. And I think that maybe my kids, like, corporately, right? You know, if if you hurt somebody or somebody dies while you're shooting a commercial for a brand, that's not going to do much for the brand. So I think there's a lot of a lot of safety is considered in those situations. Sure, right? Because it's 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 one step away from art. It's commercial, right? There's like it's a business decision. Um, but the one where we almost had a disaster was high heels in a marble staircase. So. Oh well, that's that you know. <laughs> Like the, the poor model was, we're in the outside of Paris in this grand staircase in, in this palace and she's in high heels and she almost fell down the stairs. Oh no. Yeah. Well, let's learn about Helena Hutchins, who is sadly the person who lost her life on Rust. Helena Hutchins was a Ukrainian born cinematographer known for her work in the American film industry, where she garnered acclaim for her artistic vision and dedication to her craft. Helena Andrasovich was born on April 10, 1979 in Hrodits, Ziemotor Oblast in Ukraine. I guess an oblast is a province? Essentially, uh, yeah. Yeah. Her father, Anatoly Andrasovich, served in the Soviet Navy, and her mother, Olga, worked as a nurse. This familial background played a significant role in shaping Helena's early years, especially considering the unique environment of a Soviet military base. Growing up in such settings, particularly in the Arctic Circle, where her father was stationed, offered Helena a distinct perspective on the world, nurturing a sense of adventure and resilience that would later influence her creative endeavors. I was watching this film the other day called About Long Grasses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were telling me about that, yeah. Which is gorgeous, and most of the setting is sort of this sparse winter landscape, and when there's not a lot to look at, you look at everything really closely and i'm wondering mm -hmm. if 
that trained her eye a little bit, you know, being yeah. in the Arctic Circle, the, this sort of, um, because you actually live panoramically, right? <laughs> Yep. Right, it's it's like panoramic living. Every every where you look is like this scene. Plus, the the eye of the Soviet filmmaker as mm. well is uh, it has a certain sparse sort of really oppressive feel to it. Like if you watch a lot of uh, older uh, yeah. well, films from what was then the USSR, yeah, it's uh, it's, it's in the psyche as well because there's yeah. a great a great deal of oppression. Mm-hmm. After the Russian equivalent of high school. Helena enrolled at the National Agricultural University and later transferred to Kiev National University, initially pursuing economics before switching her focus to journalism. Helena graduated from university with a degree in international journalism. She initially pursued a career in investigative journalism in Eastern Europe, where she developed a keen eye for storytelling through visual mediums. This background in journalism honed her narrative skills and attention to detail, elements that would later define her cinematographic style. Helena Andrasovich met Matthew Hutchins in the early 2000s while living and working in Kyiv, Ukraine. At the time, Matthew was living in Kyiv from the United States for work related to international finance. Their meeting was serendipitous, occurring when Helena was building her career in international journalism and exploring her interests in documentary filmmaking and photography. Their relationship began and blossomed across continents, reflecting a shared appreciation for adventure, culture, and the arts. The couple's connection deepened over their mutual interests and perspectives on life, leading to their marriage. After marrying in 2005, They moved to the United States, where Helena pursued her passion for cinematography, furthering her education and career in the film industry, while Matthew continued his career in law and finance. Helena became pregnant and soon gave birth to the couple's son, Andros, whom she loved dearly. Helena attended the American Film Institute AFI Conservatory, one of the most prestigious film schools in the U.S., where she graduated with a Master of Fine Arts in Cinematography. Her time at AFI shaped her technical skills and artistic sensibility. You know, I really appreciate people like her who, she's done so much already, but she Mm -hmm. keeps on learning and growing and moving countries and changing and trying new things and upgrading herself. Uh, I I, I, I guess maybe I have a little bit of that myself and and I appreciate people who are like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I feel like I'm I've never done learning when it comes to what we do and and how I tell a story and like all of that stuff I I'm finding there's always sort of a new level to get to. Absolutely. Helena Hutchins quickly made a name for herself in the competitive film industry with her ability to imbue each frame with emotion and narrative depth. Her work spanned various genres, from short films to feature-length projects, and she was known for her versatility, creativity, and ability to work under challenging conditions. Her notable works include the feature films Arch Enemy in 2020, directed by Adam Egypt Mortimer, and Darlin, 2019, directed by Pollyanna McIntosh. Hutchins' ability to capture the essence of a story visually made her a sought-after cinematographer among independent filmmakers. Her peers in the industry recognized her talent and contributions to cinematography. In 2019, Hutchins was selected as one of American cinematographers' rising stars of cinematography, a testament to her skill, vision, and potential to impact the film industry significantly. Matthew Hutchins' support of Helena's ambitions and career was endless. He often spoke of her dedication to her craft and her vision as a cinematographer. Beyond her professional accomplishments, Hutchins was known for her spirited, generous, and collaborative nature. Colleagues and friends often spoke of her kindness, dedication to mentorship, her family, and commitment to supporting fellow filmmakers, especially women in the industry. She believed in the power of cinema to change perspectives and create empathy, values reflected in her work and her interactions with those around her. Overall, Helena Hutchins was a good person, a loving mom and wife, and talented cinematographer with a bright future ahead of her. Enter writer-director Joel Souza. Joel Souza was born on June 14, 1973, 
He's renowned for his unique storytelling approach in cinema. He embarked on his filmmaking journey inspired by iconic movies like Raiders of the Lost Ark, 1981, which sparked his interest in the craft. Souza's directional debut came in 2010 with Hannah's Gold, a family adventure film. He gained further recognition with Crown Vic, a thriller that premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival and explores the life of patrol car officers. This film drew mixed reviews, with some critics noting similarities to Training Day in 2001. During the pre-production of Sousa's movie Crown Vic, he came into contact with actor Alec Baldwin. Baldwin was at one time attached to star in the film, but after financing issues and scheduling prevented Baldwin from an acting role in the film, he did stay on as a producer. Baldwin enjoyed Sousa's vision, as shown in Crown Vic, and was impressed by him, so the two began discussing making a western together. Sousa began writing the script that would eventually become Rust, with Baldwin in the starring role. Baldwin would star in the film, act as one of the producers, and co-write the story with Joel Sousa. Rust is set in the 1880s in Kansas and revolves around the character of Harlan Rust, played by Alec Baldwin, an aging outlaw. The narrative is inspired by a historical account of the youngest person ever hanged in the American West. The story unfolds as Rust goes on a mission to rescue his 13-year-old grandson, who has been sentenced to hang for the accidental killing of a local rancher. The film delves into themes of revenge and is described as being in similar vein to the 1992 Clint Eastwood western, Unforgiven. Alec Baldwin said he'd always wanted to be in a Western and claimed to have the chops to do it. He told The Hollywood Reporter magazine, quote, I'm an actor of the old school, so if you read my resume, my motorcycle riding, my French juggling, my horseback riding, my gunplay, is all right at my fingertips at all times, end quote. He makes himself sound like a circus act. <laughs> yeah. Look at me speak French while motorcycle riding on a horse and juggling. We've all heard the stuff about Alec Baldwin over the years, and we'll we'll get into more yeah, of that we, in okay. the second episode about his his personality, how that might have come into play. And you mention it later on. According to the Internet Movie Database (IMDb), the budget for Rust was set between six and seven million dollars. For most people, that sounds like a lot of money, but in filmmaking terms, Rust is a low-budget movie. Low-budget film financing primarily involves sourcing funds from private investors, crowdfunding, government grants, and film tax incentives. These films often rely on a tight budget, necessitating creative approaches to minimize cost while maximizing production value. Private investors contribute in exchange for a share of potential profits attracted by the project's artistic vision or commercial prospects. Crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter allow filmmakers to raise funds directly from the audience, offering perks or credits in return. Government grants and incentives in various regions support cultural production and can significantly offset costs. Additionally, low-budget projects often lean on in-kind contributions, deferred payments, and the filmmaker's own resources to stretch their budget further. The goal is to craft a compelling narrative within financial constraints, leveraging resourcefulness and innovation to bring the film to life. Before they started shooting Rust, a distribution company called The Avenue acquired the rights to the film for $2 million. As with many other projects on Rust, a committee comprised of several producers and the director hired the department heads for the film. When it comes to how the film looks, cinematography especially, the director is almost solely responsible for choosing the DOP, director of photography, often by way of a list of talented and within-budget candidates. At the recent involuntary manslaughter trial of Rust armorer Hannah Gutierrez, an emotional Joel Souza testified about how Helena Hutchins had become involved in the film. And here's some audio of his testimony. Over time, just generally as a director, if I would see the work of a cinematographer that I admired, I would just make a note of it, make a note of their name. And I had seen a trailer for a movie she did. I think it was called Arch Enemy. Um, and I just was impressed visually. It looked like something that was sort of my, it fit my style. And so I looked into some of her other work 
and I had added her to a list of, of other names I had put together over the years. I know, I think, I can't remember what publication, if it was an American cinematographer or something like that, but they had named her one of 10 cinematographers to watch. That's a big deal. And, uh, and so when the time came, uh, generally I would ask one of the producers to start, if you could reach out to their agents and I could start talking to people and you know these are the people I'm most interested in and they would do that and see who's available and who's not. And then I can't remember the exact number of people I spoke to, the exact number of cinematographers. It was a decent amount, you know, more than seven or eight. And, uh, but we had a, it was all over Zoom. We were in the middle of COVID still. Uh, we had a very long Zoom conversation where it's those kind of great conversations where first you're sort of talking about what are your influences, what are your that, and by the end you're just enjoying a great conversation. And, uh, in the end, it had, uh, it had come down to her and a few other uh, women who I was a fan of. And uh, it was, they were all excellent, but something about uh, Helena just, we were really, really, really in tune with what we both thought the movie should be. She had some really interesting references she would make. I mean, my references would always tend to be a little more mainstream and she would be talking about some avant-garde Russian filmmaker and I, that's a hole in my game and she was going to fill it and I loved that. And So that's, that's how I, I asked the producers to, uh, told, her that, told them that's who I wanted. Please don't botch the deal because uh, she's great. And So that's how we, we came to work together. So. Souza also testified that he was impressed with Helena's association with the AFI. AFI is a... Uh, prestigious uh, name in our in our business. I think it's it's always impressive to me when someone goes through there. I think um, as a woman cinematographer, I think that's doubly impressive just because if you look at the numbers in this business, they're sort of atrocious in that regard. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, in that coupled with the work I'd seen from her and just, you know, she was very keen to do a Western uh, as I think all filmmakers are because it's just a, a really interesting thing to do visually. Okay. And, uh, but she, yeah, I think between those things, between her work and her, you know, her background, I think she was kind of a no-brainer to me. So there you go. Um, thoughts on the process of choosing a cinematographer there, Matthew? Yeah, it tracks. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's, it's... Um... You've, you've hired creatives before, so you, you know exactly. Yeah, I've hired creatives. I've... I've... I've been pitched different uh, directors, mm -hmm. right? And um, it's sometimes when you're talking to them, mm -hmm. so often what you'll get is you'll get directors for commercial, you get, get them to do a rough idea of how they would approach it. Sure. And and sometimes they, they just nail it and you have a conversation and you realize that your head's space is in the same place or... They bring mm -hmm. something to the table that you're like you hadn't thought of. You yeah. hadn't thought of, and and a way of doing it that um, could either go completely wrong or completely right. And you have to right. be able, to, yeah. and you have to be able to take that sort of um, leap of faith um, in the creative process to get to something that's way better than you, uh, who is not a filmmaker, mm -hmm. uh, could get to, and sort of trust trust the experts. Yeah. From the end of August through the beginning of September 2021, Joel Souza, Helena Hutchins, and the rest of the pre-hired crew went to Santa Fe, New Mexico to begin prepping the film. This often includes location scouting, technical visits to locations, hiring more cast and crew, adhering to a budget created by the line producer, and scheduling the film for which the first AD is responsible. The first assistant director on this film was David Halls. Halls has quite a resume in film and television, having worked his way up the ranks in the AD department. His experience spans a variety of roles, chief among them are first assistant director and second unit director, showcasing his ability to oversee significant aspects of the filmmaking process. He is credited with having worked on 85 titles. His involvement ranged from high-profile projects to smaller independent films and shorts, demonstrating his versatility and adaptability. His credits include The Matrix Reloaded, Bad Santa, Bone Tomahawk, Shot Caller, and North Country. 
The cast expanded in September 2021 with the addition of Travis Fimmel, Brady Noon, and Francis Fisher, followed in October 2021 by Jensen Ackles, who I worked with doing locations department day calls on the TV show Supernatural. Russ's production team was made up of around 150 crew members, including locals making up half the team, alongside 22 primary and 230 background actors. Due to budgetary constraints, the entire shooting process was planned for 21 days, which is shorter than the typical schedule for feature films that I've worked on. As the film was a western and gun-heavy, Rust Movie Productions was looking to hire an armorer to oversee the firearms on set. The production looked at numerous armorers to fill the role. However, the budget was such that a few of the more experienced armorers did not seek employment on the film, and others were rejected due to the expense of their packages. Ultimately, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, 24, not yet a union member, was hired as the film's armorer. She was inexperienced. This would only be her second role as a head armorer on a film set. She did, however, come with a pedigree in the business. Hannah's actual last name is simply Gutierrez, but she has hyphenated it to indicate her relationship to her stepdad, Thel Reed a very famous armorer in the film business. Thel Reed, born on February 11, 1943, in Downey, California, is known for his expertise as an exhibition shooter, stuntman, armorer, and movie consultant. From his teenage years, Reed competed in shooting competitions, achieving recognition as one of six combat masters for his quick-draw skills. The prowess led him to a career in the movie industry where he trained actors like Russell Crowe and Brad Pitt for roles requiring gun handling. Reed has also worked on some huge films, many of them westerns, including Tombstone, L.A. Confidential, Blade, Flags of Our Fathers, Grindhouse, 310 to Yuma, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Despite hiring her as the film's armorer due to budget constraints, Not every day would require an armor, and Hannah Gutierrez was also hired as a props assistant for the other filming days, a much lower paying position and more affordable for the production. So they would have a full-time props assistant and their armor would still be on set in case. Before her involvement in Rust, Hannah Gutierrez's firearms handling had already sparked concerns. During her work on a Nicolas Cage movie, The Old Way, There was an incident she improperly handed a firearm to a young actress, prompting a temporary halt in production. Additionally, her casual approach to handling guns and the unsafe manner in which she loaded blanks were noted by colleagues as potential safety risks. According to an article on the Daily Beast news site, quote, She was a bit careless with the guns, waving it around every now and again, said a source who worked alongside armor Hannah Gutierrez-Reed on the upcoming Nicolas Cage film The Old Way. There were a couple of times she was loading the blanks and doing it in a fashion that we thought was unsafe, end quote. So you, there's a lot of alarm bells right there. Um, yeah. If that's her job on mm-hmm. set. And it... This is that was her first job as a head armorer as well. Yeah, and I'm I'm sorry, but anyone who's twenty, I don't want to be ageist. Twenty four, yeah. But anyone who's twenty four years old should not be the head armorer on a shoot. You just do not have the experience. She did not have the experience. If I'm a producer and I'm hiring somebody who is going to be responsible for safety on set. I'm going to maybe check their references, you know? I'm not saying this didn't happen. Maybe the producers were aware that the stuff had happened on the old way, but I would be hesitant to hire that person, (laughs) if that makes any sense. Well, yeah, I mean, if she's their armorer and and Mm -hmm. that's the feedback you get, uh, I wouldn't be hiring her. Yeah. And it's, you know. Yep. um, Her days of armorer are probably gone. We'll get into that in the second episode as well. There's, there's so much more to be told here. As filming began, numerous sources among the crew on Rust told news organizations that before the tragedy that took Helena Hutchins' life and wounded director Joel Souza, they felt rushed and had to fight tooth and nail with the production for small budgetary concessions for extra crew, time on set, and other resources they felt necessary to do their jobs. 
The most concerning thing to a few of the Rust crew members was the care and handling of firearms on set. They expressed concerns about Hannah Gutierrez, their green armor. Typically, between takes or camera turnarounds on sets that I've worked on, many with lower budgets than Rust, the armorer will take control of firearms on set to ensure set safety. There are multiple documented instances of this not happening on Rust. For example, untrained extras waving around a shotgun. Yes, it may not have been loaded with even blanks, but it is still supposed to be in the armorer's control. No, but this is the most basic thing that needs to be done and that she should have been doing. Mm -hmm. Is is that the point of an armorer yep. is to take control and ensure safety. Yep. Yep. That, that's the point. That's the job. It was the job, but apparently she wasn't doing that. Crew members cited improperly trained actors waving real guns around on set between takes, sometimes not maintaining what is called muzzle discipline, carelessly pointing the firearms at other cast and the crew. Muzzle discipline, on film sets or anywhere else, involves always pointing the gun in a safe direction, ensuring it's never aimed at someone who is at someone unless absolutely necessary for the scene, under strict safety protocols. Trigger discipline is the same thing. Do not put your finger on the trigger unless you plan to fire that weapon. Other gun safety protocols include checking the firearm's status before each use, declaring whether it's cold, unloaded, or hot, loaded with blanks, never live ammunition, and strict adherence to safety briefings. The armorer is responsible for managing all firearms on set, ensuring they're correctly prepared and safe to use educating cast and crew on proper handling, and maintaining control over firearms to prevent accidents. Several crew members claim, and video evidence supports, Hannah Gutierrez herself not following safety procedures. She was sloppy and unprofessional. A B-roll video showed Hannah taking a shotgun from an actor by the barrel, pointed up at her own face. Video evidence of Alec Baldwin was also telling. In one instance, Baldwin can be seen firing his pistol unsafely in a take involving gunfire using blanks, closer to the camera than is typical protocol. Usually they're 20 feet or so away. He was like right there. Baldwin continues to pull the trigger in another take, firing another blank round even after Joel Souza calls cut. And this is a huge no-no. Any armorer that I've worked with would have stepped in at this point and taken control to ensure no further instances of this behavior, either by retraining the actor or, in extreme circumstances, removing the firearm entirely from the actor. Yeah, well, this, so my question here becomes, he's not just any actor, he's, right. uh, uh, he's one of the Baldwins, now probably... He's the star of the film, yep. And the star of the family of Baldwins, mm -hmm. right? A big star. Like, not, not, not a star of the film, just he's like a star in his own right. Every, like, everyone listening to this knows who he is when we say his name. That's why I'm not really talking about who he is, because right? everybody knows. And um, he's also the producer, mm -hmm. one of the producers. So was there maybe a little bit of a... Uh, oh, he's a big star producer, a little bit of uh, a fear of telling him off. This is exactly where Hannah Gutierrez's defense tends to go okay. uh, with this kind of thing. So, yep, we'll continue to learn more about this. It's crazy. Okay. There are other concerning things, specifically from Alec Baldwin, around firearms on the set of Rust. Again, in some B-roll video, Baldwin can be heard yelling, One more, one more, one more, right away, let's reload to Hannah Gutierrez in regard to her reloading the firearms for his next take. Rushing is not something that should be encouraged around firearms. In fact, it is up to the armorer to make sure things move no faster than the time required to ensure the safety of everyone on a film set in regard to firearms. There were also two accidental firearms discharges on a single day of filming on Rust. One discharge is rare, two in one day is unheard of. From the Daily Beast, quote, The crew had complained to the first assistant director over the prop gun misfiring, the source claimed. Quote, All of us yelled at him. That better be on the production report. These guys are irresponsible and shouldn't be here, they explained. 
That should be automatic grounds for termination on a union film set. You should be gone. The first time that gun went off without telling anybody, that whole department should have been replaced immediately. Clearly, production thought better of it and decided to roll the dice and pay the ultimate price, end quote. In her defense, Hannah Gutierrez tried to focus more on her armorer duties and spend less time on props. However, Gabrielle Pickle, the film's line producer, admonished her for doing so. According to the LA Times on October 14, 2021, a week before the shooting, Gabrielle Pickle expressed concerns via email about a crew complaint regarding two unattended shotguns on set. She critiqued Gutierrez Reed for not sufficiently supporting the prop master, Sarah Zachary, and for focusing too much on her armorer duties. Pickle wrote, We hired you as both armor and key assistant props. It has been brought to my attention that you are focusing far more on armor and not on supporting props as needed, end quote. And Hannah fought back. Since we started, I've had a lot of days where my job should only be to focus on the guns and everyone's safety, Hannah wrote, noting that on gun-heavy days during the filming, the assistant props role, quote, has to take a back seat, live firearms on set is absolutely my priority, end quote. When I'm focused to do both jobs, that's when mistakes get made, Hannah wrote. Seven days later, Helena Hutchins died. Joel Souza was injured, and the lives of crew members on the set that day were changed forever. Next week, in part two of Reckless Rust, the death of Helena Hutchins, we'll learn about the events of the day of the shooting and the fallout so far. Yeah, that's really interesting back and forth there that you just read. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, if somebody's an, I don't know, I don't care how small your budget is, if you're dealing with guns, you should have an armor who's an armor. Yeah, and that, again, will be a portion of Hannah Gutierrez's defense, as we'll see. Hmm. That's right, it's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at one 327 5786 or one 877 dark We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. All right, let's check out our first voicemail. Hey, fellas. Robot Pete here. Sorry for the multiple voicemails. My robot circuits got a little gooey and I called too soon. In a recent episode, you asked for listeners to call in with a joke. I've reviewed my robot repository and found this inappropriate joke for you. Why did the vacuum cleaner break up with the broom? Well, it realized they had different sweeping styles and couldn't handle the dirty corners of their relationship. (laughs) But let me emphasize, this is purely a tale of household appliances and has absolutely nothing to do with any inappropriate or suggestive content. Thanks for the shows and go shit in your hats. P.S give my robot love to steve oh oh boy (laughs) um yeah so (laughs) So that was great big pete doing robot pete it it was robot pete it wasn't great big pete it was robot pete and that was a very bad joke (laughs) well i i was sure there was something that would have had to do with sucking oh yes yeah that's that's where i thought it was going as well Mm. um do you remember the cartoon when you're a little kid romeo and julie ate Yes, I do. I loved that. I loved it. That was loved like an it. early robot story. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that? that yes. Just, it just reminded me of that. Romeo yeah. and Julie, Julie 8. Julie 8. Yeah, it was so cool. It was Canadian, I think. I, was it? I do believe it might have been. Okay. If it was, I think it was Nelvana, which was the animation company way back when. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you, the robot. Thank you, Robot Pete. Thank you, Robot Great Big Pete. We appreciate that. (laughs) Uh, And here's another. Hi, Mike and Matthew. Uh, Long-time listener here. I'm from Vancouver Island. I've been listening to your podcast for quite a few years now. I just wanted to say that I really appreciate how you guys deliver your content and all the research and hard work that goes into it. It's also very entertaining, so you guys put a twist with your sense of humor 
in a respectful way and I very much appreciate again the delivery of your content anyways I just wanted to say hi and tell you to go take a shit in your hat well thank you very much over Thanks. there on Vancouver Island I'm, the, I'm hoping we get over there at some point soon again because well, I, I can, love it I can see it from my window yeah yeah let's go over there <laughs> it's so close I, I kind of want to do Nanaimo this time. I mean, we've done Victoria a few times, but I'd like to maybe see if we can talk to folks in Nanaimo, have like a little get together there. I wonder if they'd be in, into it. I, I'd like to do Tofino. Tofino? <laughs> yeah. Tofino is nice. I like Tofino. It's a bit of a drive though. Anyway. But, but it's Tofino. Yes, but it's Tofino. Okay, so somebody just called from Florida who hadn't called since 2023, but it broke up so they couldn't play it or hear you. So can you please call back next yeah. week? Call us back, please. Right, because yeah. I was like, somebody called 2023, hadn't called since then. I want to hear what she had to say. I want to hear it too. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or... One eight seven seven D A R K P T N. We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. Okay, so it's time for Patreon and Donut Money donors, and we do have a new patron this week, oh. and that person's name is Drumroll Ian James, and Ian is from Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. P I I. P-E-I. How about that? So what do you think Ian Byrne does there in Prince Edward Island, Matthew? He is a Vizsla breeder. A Vizsla breeder? Oh, yes. we've had we've had a Vizsla breeder before, I think. No, we did not. We had something to do with Vizslas. Really? Yep. But huh. uh, I love Vizslas. They're, they're a nice dog. My friends Rick and Wendy had a Vizsla. I don't know if you know that. I have my doggy calendar on my desk, and today is a bees list, so that's what made me think of it. Oh, nice. They're such handsome dogs. Yeah, they are. We've got a couple more patrons as well. Oh, nice. We have Stephen Bryan, and (laughs) Stephen is from Abbotsford, British Columbia, where you think I live, but I don't. (laughs) I live in Langley. Uh, But Stephen is from Abbotsford. So what does Stephen do there? In Abbotsford, Stephen Bryan. He turns me around when I'm trying to find you and sends me to whatever town you live in. Okay, so he's he works sort of in tourism and uh, in no, just, ass- just, assisting dum dums. No, just for me. I just I pam. <laughs> just for you. I pam. What what town do you live in again? Langley. Langley. Yeah, he sends me to Langley every time I go to Abbotsford. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well. Thank you so Thank much, you, Stephen, Stephen, for doing that because uh, <laughs> Matthew gets lost. He just there's, gets lost. There's an airport in Abbotsford, isn't there? Yes, there is. Okay. But I, I really like taking the a- airport from Bellingham if I'm going somewhere in the States. Bellingham. Bellingham. Uh, and we have one more, one more. One more. Patron. And her name is Nadia Kirilova. Nadia, Nadia Kirilova. Kirilova. I, I don't know if Nadia, where Nadia is from, but I don't want to make any assumptions. Nadia is mm-hmm. from a very small town mm-hmm. called Alert. Alert? Like yeah. Alert Bay? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. What's she, what's she doing up there in Alert Bay, British Columbia? What is she doing there? Yeah. Nadia is a weather balloon specialist. Oh, the, I could see how that would be useful up there. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Yep. So she she like she knows the, she used to design them, but now she like man, manages them. And okay, and, yeah. Well, there and, you go. And all those UFO scares we had a while ago, they're they're Nadia's balloons. They were her balloons. Yeah, yeah. she should be more careful with <laughs> balloons because you know. Uh, didn't, uh, people get, uh, the armed forces got sent up there to blow up those balloons. So, I mean, she, she probably lost, um, lost a bit of cash. Yeah. She that. lost a few balloons. Yeah. Yeah. She lost a few balloons and, and, uh, you know, the government had to spend, uh, an inordinate amount of money 
to ensure <laughs> that uh, the boom, the balloons were blown up. <laughs> so yeah, be more careful with your balloons, please, please. You know, for the for the sake of all of us, be be more careful with your balloons. Thank you to all the Patreons. Yes, thank you. Uh, we don't very have any, much appreciated. No, no, no new donut money donors, but uh, that is coolio. Thanks to all our patrons and donut money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. I guess I should put up a link to the pre-orders for my second book on darkpoutine.com and on our other socials because uh, that's happening now. You can pre-order my book on Amazon, Audible, and uh, Apple Books as well. I'm sure other places. I haven't checked chapters Indigo, but when probably did, there when too. Did, when did social become socials? I don't know. Do you I remember know. when we called it social? Social media, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, but it, now wait, it's it's but, socials because they're different accounts, I guess. When did that pop up? I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I don't pay attention. I just I'm just going along it's with one the of trend. those words that bothers me. There you go. Well, a lot of things seem to be bothering you today. So right. anyway, that's it for this episode, including you. <laughs> Until next time, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bah humbug. Bah humbug, says Grumpy Matthew. <laughs> Bye.